firstly, um, you know, I'm sitting here uh, down in the southwest and uh, home of the Noongar Nation. We're all spread across the country in different places. So I'd like to collecti collectively acknowledge our traditional owners um, of country right across Australia and recognise their connection to land, our waters and the, and the culture. And we pay our respects to the elders, past, present and the new ones coming through. Um, an exciting time, in fact. Um, I should also acknowledge uh, the state NRM. Um, this webinar is supported by funding from the WA Government State NRM program. Um, and it has made uh, the, a lot of the sort of research and background work possible. And of course, I'd like to um, acknowledge and welcome our speakers, uh, Stephen Kelly uh, from the Clean Energy Regulators Office, uh, Ben Lodge uh, from the Land Regeneration Group, uh, Tristy Fairfield um, from uh, the Carbon Man the Carbon Team and in Deepherd, and Jasmine Boxnell. Um, from Consolidated Pastoral Company in Queensland, um, who have an active herd methodology project running. And of course, uh, Dr. Andrew Edwards uh, from the Charles Darwin Uni, and uh, my good friend, Ryan Foley, um, from the Aboriginal Carbon Foundation. Now we're going to, in the sort of order um, that I've just spoken of the speakers, we'll go through in that order. Um, and no doubt, well, I hope most of you have been able to have a look at the fact sheets that uh, sit behind um, what's being delivered today. And just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, please make sure that you keep yourself on mute. Uh, the questions can be typed into the conversation section. Um, and Joy Sherlock, uh, one of our staff, is collating those. And we will pose those uh, questions um, depending on our time at the end of the webinar to the panel. But if you have questions that you'd like to ask uh, privately, you can do that by emailing um, the info at rangelands.com.au uh, email address, which is on the flyer. And I'll also put it in the conversation section right as we speak now. Um, so without any further ado, uh, Stephen Kelly from the regulator's office. We're sort of looking forward to hearing from him and you know what might be updated, what's what's happening in the in the regulator's uh, world. Um, well, I'm coming from Canberra, Ngunnawal country. So welcome everyone. Um, so the emissions reduction fund is is my uh where i work so the, the at the clean energy regulator in the savannah agriculture and soil team can everyone see the slideshow is that working okay yes right. for me yes all right excellent let's keep going then so um today i wanted to just go through the carbon farming and its benefits and then we'll have a look at a few of the methods that uh were on those those uh, sheets that came out, which I thought actually were really good. So good job on those. Um, so when we're looking at the the ERF, the Emissions Reduction Fund, really, obviously, it's uh, a benefit to both farmers and it's a benefit to the environment. And it's also a benefit to Australia in meeting its um, emissions targets. So um, on your farm, you're going to get some improved productivity. It's going to help the land, which is amazing. Um, and it's going to diversify your revenue. So you can think if you've got um, beef on the land or you're growing um, some sort of crop, you're also going to be adding another revenue stream, which uh, will hopefully help you out when the next drought comes. Um, and those, you know, are coming um, and, and various weather things are coming more frequently at the moment, aren't they? So. Um, so carbon farming activities, um, there's lots of different ones. There's lots and lots of methods. Um, mainly they revolve around growing trees um, or regenerating um, vegetation, storing carbon um, in soil, and better management of livestock and effluent. Um, so eff effluent is 
burning off the methane in um, big pits, which is great fun, um, and managing savannah burning as well. So that's one of the bigger ones out in um, WA and Queensland, savannah burning. Um, and we've got um, quite a few cattle projects um, in Queensland, and we're hoping to get some out in Western Australia soon, as well as possibly into the Northern Territory, depending on the land there. Um, there is also a lot of industrial projects um, and methods, but I don't think we're concerned with that in this webinar. So let's move on. Um, so participating in the ERF, um, this makes it look quite simple. It is, it's, there's a lot of paperwork and there's a lot of work to be done uh, and it takes a long time. So you are in for the long haul when you sign up for the ERF. So really you can just follow these steps, thinking about the activities you wanna do. So if you're on the land and you've got cattle, then running a beef herd cattle management project um, sounds like something you could do. Um, you apply to register. So you go on our website, sign up, and then you can register a project. We'll assess it and make sure that it's following the rules make sure that you're eligible and then you um, can start running your project. Um, after that, you'll start submitting reports every couple of years and we'll start giving you um, Australian carbon credit units and then you do that over and over again until the project finishes. Um, so it's it's a lot of work um, and it is rewarding. There is there is lots of money involved and um, so we, we, we are um, pushing the beef herd cattle management method at the moment. So we're really looking for um, that as uh, along with soil projects to um, increase the portfolio here. Um, we want to help you. So if you have questions around any method and especially those ones, give me a call um, or send us an email and we'll help you out with those. We've got a bit more information on those particular methods later as well. But I think I've only got five minutes, so I don't want to dump too much info on you guys now. So as you can see, this is this is the state of the Emissions Reduction Fund in July this year. So we've got 100 projects already in Western Australia and Queensland has even more. New South Wales has the largest amount, um, which is a lot of human induced regeneration projects and the majority of the industrial projects. Queensland ha also has a lot of tree growing projects, has a few beef herd projects and a lot of industrial projects as well. Um, so as you can see, a lot of ACUs have gone out and when you think about how much that's worth, um, on average at the moment, I think they they sold at auction for around $15. So that's a lot of um, a lot of revenue that has gone out into the Australian public and a lot of ACUs that have gone towards our meeting our targets for the uh, Kyoto Protocols. All right, so let's have a look at a couple of the methods. Um, so a method is the legislation that governs what you have to do to be able to gain ACUs is the very basic overview. Uh, it has various parts that tell you what you must do to uh, apply for a project, what you must do to um, then report on that project, and, and what we have to do as a regulator to ensure um, that your project is correct and that we can give you ACUs. Um, let's go forwards here. So one of the key ones, key parts of the emissions reduction fund is maintaining existing vegetation. So that is avoiding clearing of native um, trees and, and regrowth. Um, so there's, there's some where you will stop clearing and let the pasture regrow. Uh, into trees. Um, there are some where you'll maintain a forest that's already there and there's some where you will directly seed and um, assist the land to regrow. So there's an avoided clearing project in the Maranoa region. Um, that project has already earned 1, 150,000 ACUs, which is a very large sum of money and is an excellent um, sort of carbon sink. Um, so assisting regeneration, human induced regeneration. So that is one of the key ones that um, everyone here seems to be interested in. Um, so to do that, you can uh, install new fencing, implement uh, rotational grazing to, you know, allow that that uh, land to regenerate. Um, you can get rid of all the goats uh, humanely, of course. Um, and again, there's another project there and that one's earned 650,000 ACUs. So that is an extremely large sum of money. Obviously it's a very large project, 
Um, but you guys have a very large amount of land out in Western Australia, so I'd like to see some this size coming out of this, if possible. Um, planting trees, so reforestation, um, and there's the specific one around Mali planting, plantation forestry, new farm forestry plantations, so that those are some of the methods there. Um, if you have any questions around any of this, please give us a call, um, give us an email, have a look at our website. It has vast amounts of information. information. Um, okay, we'll, we'll move on because I don't have much time here. Uh, and I think we started a bit late. Livestock, uh, so beef herd cattle management. Um, this one is uh, basically what you're trying to do is grow the animals faster than you normally would uh, so that they're alive for a shorter amount of time, which means that they have less opportunity to um, emit methane from their burps, basically. So that whole method is around productivity gains and um, basically keeping those animals um, alive for less time. Um, and they will uh, then give you accues for that reason. Um, it hasn't got too many projects at the moment, but we are hoping that this one comes um, comes good soon and we'll have a rush of projects. I've had a lot of interest from um, people like yourselves who are looking to do a beef herd project as well as a soil project on the same piece of land. So if you are interested in that, get in touch because um, we are also interested in um, looking at that possibility. Um, soil is another very large part of the, um, the portfolio and is increasing uh, at the moment at a very fast rate. Um, we have a very large amount of projects uh, coming in and being assessed at the moment. So what that is, is changing your ag agricultural processes to st store carbon in the soil. Um, you do a sample and then at the start and then you sample it before you report with us and the difference um, where it changes, you can see a difference and that's the accus. Um, again, that one, that one's quite complicated and is uh, it's an excellent method. So there are people out there that can help you if you'd like to find them, um, have a search on the internet. Um, so the future of the ERF. We've had recently had a pretty big change. The method development has moved from the Department of Industry over to the Clean Energy Regulator. So we're just sorting through how we will be doing the uh, method development. Um, we've got a, a big set of priorities from the minister already. So we'll be working towards that. Um, the Department of Industry um, will we'll still set the priorities guided by the minister. And um, there's some um, there, the blue carbon method is coming up, something that we'll be working on. Soil carbon, savannah burning are some that we're also looking at quite intensely. And we're hoping to uh, either make some changes to those methods or make some newer methods um, coming in the next uh, year or so. There is also a new beef herd um, management method in the works. Science is still being sorted out on that one, so I can't really give you an update on the timing on that one. Um, but if you want to be involved with that, there is a, there will be emails coming out and um, I might send one through to the rangelands to see if there's anyone who would like uh, to find more information on that going forward. Um, look, and there's also that email address there, uh, Method Development at Clean Energy Regulator, if you want to find out more on that topic. Um, lastly, so obviously we look after the methods. Visit our website, give us an email, um, phone us up, ask for Stephen if you if you want to talk to me. Otherwise, the contact centre will guide you to the right place. Um, and follow us on Twitter. Uh, thanks for listening. Thanks, Stephen. And uh, a brief but great update from the um, CER office. And um, I will be speaking with you again shortly. Um, thank you. Our next, our next speaker is uh, Ben Lodge on uh, soil carbon. Uh, Ben's had a long career working around production of natural systems, um, focused on aligning land use with, with uh, land systems, and particularly on increasing product production and profit profitability while you know doing that. So. Um, I'll hand over to you, Ben, to uh, and try and get your slideshow up at the same time. Thanks, Steve. Um, I will. I've just had a storm pass through here, 
I'm over in um, Queensland, so I might keep my uh, video off so that you guys can just hear me, hopefully. Am I coming through all right? I presume so. Um, yes, Steve, mate, all clear. Okay, thanks, guys. Right, Steve, you've got that. Um, so soil carbon plays an important role in the rangelands. Um, carbon, as most of you will know, is a foundation of all life, and it's the engine for soil fertility. Carbon is a building block of microbes as well, which are the driving force behind nutrient cycling, getting nutrients into the new root zone, creating topsoils and getting nutrients for pasture as well. And that can help with nutrient intent, integrity, nutrient density. It's also really important for water retention as well. Um, on average, rangelands lose around 92% of rainfall as runoff, which is pretty sad. Um, and a little known fact is that one gram of carbon can store 28 grams of water. It's effectively like a, a rainfall sponge um, and it really helps soak up the rain. If you do some assessments on rangelands that have got really good carbon content, you can actually have a 100 mil rainfall event soak straight in um, to the soil. Uh, however, mostly it usually runs off and ends up um, in the creeks and washing down. Uh, next slide, please, Dave. Uh, soil carbon has been losing, um, been getting lost from um, the ground over over the last couple of centuries. Um, and globally around 50 to 100 billion tonnes have been lost since the Industrial Revolution. Uh, for me, that's, that's really important because it indicates what we can actually get back into the soil. Um, this is around when you sort of start looking at your own properties. Uh, this obviously this is average. That's around 14 and a half tonnes of carbon per hectare. Um, that's carbon, not CO2 equivalent. Um, and if, in a practical sense, when you convert that into the um, one gram per 28, uh, that's 40 mil of rainfall, which is would be much better to have on your property than off it. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please, Steve. Now, this is what I call the brain hurt slide. Um, so, uh, brain hurt because it helps put the financial context around it. Um, as everyone knows, climate change, for better or worse, is now a term that everyone knows. Um, globally, globally, countries are signing up to emissions targets, which are based on many factors, one of which is keeping um, our temperatures down below one and a half degrees. Uh, budgets have been established for countries, and people are looking at both two things. One is the one and a half degree aspect, but also carbon neutral down the track. Um, there's a lot of talk about carbon neutral 2030 and a lot of talk about carbon neutral 2050 as well. Um, as Steve mentioned before, there's lots of methods that are around. Um, we call that natural capital methods because when you have improving, when you're improving your natural capital in a landscape, you can actually get money for that. Uh, the currency, as probably you all know, is a tonne of carbon dioxide equivalent. That's what we're talking about here today. That's an ACU. Um, this is a bit out of date. The latest average auction, auction price was 15 bucks a tonne. Um, next slide, please, Steve. So in relation to rangelands, um, you can monetize the increases in soil carbon um, and other natural capital. Uh, and the revenue can be pretty significant and you can actually do that whilst improving productivity. There's some fantastic examples of improved productivity, 100% uh, increase, 200% increase, there's one I've got in my mind which is actually a 500% increase in productivity from the measures that are taken that also can help sequester soil carbon. Um, as you probably know, you need to adopt different management practices. That's one of the key requirements for starting a carbon project. Um, and Steve touched on some before, changing from set stocking to planned grazing. Um, so you can rest your pasture mass and start getting your underground livestock going. That's your root mass, your soil biology, and all of those sorts of things, which, which is a critical part of soil carbon sequestration. Next slide, please, Steve. Um, so I'm keeping things high level 
because we don't have much time. Uh, as I mentioned, Ben, we seem to have lost you. Are you there? He's, go he's gone on mute for some reason. Okay, have you got me back? Yep. We do. Okay. Sorry about that, guys. Um, so keeping things pretty high level because we don't have much time. Um, a key question everyone should be asking before they start any new practices on their property, and new practices must be undertaken for the purpose of a carbon project. Um, but you should be asking, can I earn natural capital revenue from this? And is it appropriate to be using this practice to generate this revenue? Um, our view, Land Regeneration Group, is that practices should target improved production and they shouldn't lock up land. Um, and we believe that there are many practices that can be applied to do that and get significant natural capital from doing that. Obviously, you need to consider the property objectives resources you've got, and land characteristics and all those sorts of things, that, that is a big part of it. Um, the practices need to be maintained or the carbon will end up declining again. That's why there has been such a reduction in soil carbon over the last decades and centuries. Um, and the carbon must be properly measured. Steve talked about this a little bit before. Uh, carbon in soil is very variable. It's very complex. Um, and it has to be measured. That's been one of the major impediments to why rangeland soil carbon projects haven't been taken up and very accessible previously. Um, that has to be properly measured. It has to be taken into consideration uh, significantly. Um, and then obviously at various intervals throughout the project, yeah, you must measure it. Um, as I mentioned before, sticking points historically have been measuring carbon at, sc at scale. Cost of adopting new practices can be a key consideration because you do have to adopt new practices. Some of them, wire and water, can be pretty expensive. Um, and the reliability of sequestering carbon is also something that needs to be managed carefully. Uh, if you don't adopt practices that are robust and defendable, then you can actually spend a lot of money if you're doing it for the carbon projects and sit there spinning your wheels without necessarily getting a lot of carbon in the ground. However, there are good practices. Um, they can be adopted. They are proven. Um, and in our view, uh, it's not easy, but the upsides are significant, especially when it increases productivity as well. Thank you, Steve. I hope that's um, sufficient enough to give everyone a bit of insight. Thanks, thanks, Ben, and I appreciate the fact that we're, you know, the time constraint means that, um, you know, we're we're pushing through on some of these things where it would have been great to spend another, you know, ten or fifteen minutes talking about it. But thanks, Ben. Um, next, we have Tristy uh, Fairfield, uh, who will speak on about human-induced re uh, regeneration, and uh, and she's with the Department of Primary Industries and Regional Development and has um is the team leader i think christy um with that group thanks steve um can you see the screen that i'm sharing at the moment yes i can everybody yes. else okay yes. great yes so thank you for the invitation to speak today i'm going to be talking about the human induced regeneration methodology so this methodology involves increasing the so-called forest cover of um, native tree species that are indigenous to the local area. And when we use the term forest, it's a fairly loose definition. It means getting areas of sparse forest cover to areas of a two metre um, height or a 20% canopy cover. Um, importantly, it doesn't involve replanting and any of those activities would render a project ineligible. So it's only about natural regeneration and it's mostly applicable to grazing lands in semi-arid regions. Um, so what it involves is managing um, external pressures, so particularly cattle grazing, to allow that um, revegetation to naturally occur. So it doesn't generally, as Stephen mentioned earlier when he was talking about this method, it doesn't really require more intensive farm infrastructure, not a whole lot of new fencing or that sort of thing. It's more about 
um, managing the way that the cattle graze or potentially feral anim animal management, <coughs> excuse me, or access to water and so forth. So importantly for um, HAR projects, because they have a, um, a 25 or 100 year permanence period, the, um, the consent of eligible interest holders is concerned, of which the state is one. So this method's been quite um, well taken up in Western Australia so far, particularly in the Gascoigne, Midwest, Northern Wheatbelt and Goldfields areas. We've had 59 projects registered, 17 have got their state consent, and two projects have already started receiving their, <coughs> excuse me, their Australian carbon credit units. So as you can see there, the projects have got contracts to deliver almost 10 tonnes of um, carbon abatement and um, an estimated $136 million. So I'll just show you this map. So this is where most of the projects have been, or all of this shows all of the projects registered to date. And you can see they're all in the southern rangelands area. And, and it's important to note that even though there's no actual geographic constraint under the um, CFI Act, um, when projects are going to be registered in other areas, there's a lot more, um, <coughs> excuse me, there's a lot of things to consider if you're going to be looking at projects that are in different areas. So this shows the forested areas in the um, southern rangelands, but importantly, you can see that there's the potential, this orange area shows the potential for regrowth, and there's also areas in the Kimberley. So these are the questions that um, the state government will be addressing when they're talking about uh, um, giving EIH consent for projects. So you can see the first one, the project area has to be on a pastoral lease land. The projects have to have a permanence period of 25 rather than 100 years. The project proponent has to be the pastoral lessee or have an agreement with the lessee. The remaining terms of all leases have to be long enough to ensure that the legal access is in place for the entire length of the project. So as we said, that's got to be um, the 25 year period. And the activities have to be consistent with the definition of pastoral lease purposes under the Land Administration Act. So particularly that means that you wouldn't be destocking your areas because that wouldn't be consistent with pastoral practices. Um, importantly, the state will have a look at whether um, the proponent has um, undertaken negotiations with the registered native title bodies corporate or provide evidence that they've either got that um, EIH consent from the RNTBCs or have undertaken the process to begin getting that EIH consent from the RNTBCs. Um, and other eligible interest holders, such as financial institutions, we would also need to see that that EIH consent has been granted from them. And importantly, and this is particularly obviously in the southern rangelands, but also any projects in the, the that Kimberley region that we've just been looking at, um, any of the um, mining interests, so existing mine leases have to be excluded, pending mining leases have to be excluded, and um, petroleum existing and pending petroleum production areas also have to be excluded. Um, if there's any other um, state infrastructure or state agreement areas, they also have to be excluded. And in particular, in those new sort of emerging areas in, in the Kimberley, um, landowners would want to be thinking about um, the timing that would take to get some of those um, uh, consents, particularly with the RNTBC consents, um, just over 90% or 93.5% of that area is um, uh, determined to claim areas. So you'd want to be thinking about the timing of um, g gaining those consents. Um, I think that's about all in terms of um, the state's expectations in terms of getting those consents. We're happy to obviously take any questions about that either through the Rangelands NRM or directly. And um, I'll hand over to you from here, Steve. Thanks, uh, Tristy. It's uh, good to have you guys on board. And uh, I know that um, the team's been working pretty solidly on, on HR for some time now. So, um, and it'll be very interesting to see um, when uh, some of these uh, actors actually enter the marketplace from WA. Um, next, we have uh, Jasmine Boxnell from um, Consolidated Pastoral Group. Um, CPC actually have a herd methodology project up and running. And uh, so it'll be great to hear from 
uh, someone who's actually um, a pastoralist uh, or representing a, a, a large pastoral group um, that has an active project. Thanks, Jas Jasmine. Fantastic. Thanks, Steve. Good afternoon, everyone. Great to be here this afternoon. Um, so I guess you do a background on myself. I've been working now with CPC for three and a half years. When I commenced my time with CPC, it's ended up lining up really well with our beef cattle herd project. So when I started, that was when we started to initiate the process. So I've been involved now uh, with the registration and baseline establishment and now through to the submission of our second offsets report. Um, to give you a bit of an outline on what I'm planning on covering off on this afternoon, I guess I've got uh, three key messages I wanted to go through on my experience. So, you know, firstly, why did CPC choose to join in the beef herd me management methodology? What was required for us? And how's it going and what have we learnt? So just bear with me, I'm going to try and share my screen here. So, so I guess, uh, firstly, why the Beef Herd Management Project? Um, we had prior experience with the emissions reduction funds. We have a savannah burning project that's sitting um, at one of our Queensland properties, and we saw the opportunity to leverage more benefits uh, across the entirety of our herd by registering for this project. And what really made it quite palatable for us was how well the requirements for the herd project aligned with our pre-existing herd management practices and productivity targets. Um, I'm not too sure if the participants here today have seen this before, but I've included a, a direct quote that's taken from the methodology paper. And what this really shows is that the methodology and its requirements perfectly align with the targets that we should be striving for already in our business. So as you can see there, um, it's about undertaking activities that are expected to reduce emissions by either increasing the weight for age of the herd, reducing average age of the herd, reducing the proportion of unproductive animals in the herd, or changing the ratio of livestock classes within the herd to increase total annual live weight gain. Um, so with that, what was required? Um, for us to go through and do the registration and baseline establishment, we, also, we had to first demonstrate that we had the legal right to the herd and the project areas that were to be included in the project. And then from that, we had to demonstrate our, our baseline. So I guess my understanding of the baseline was that it demonstrated what your emissions intensity was the three years immediately preceding to when you were intending on starting the project. And so with that, we provided uh, sale data, purchase data, transfer records, and linked with that animal age, weight, and genders. And then we also provided information about our resident herds. So this is, I guess, like your breeding herds, your breeding cows and bulls that don't really move around. And so that, like I mentioned, establishes what your emissions intensity is. And then from that, you then report against that year on year and always reporting against the most immediate three years preceding a new reporting period. So moving into what we had to do for our subsequent reporting is that we again provide the same herd data to form the report. We've structured our herd project so that it aligns with our financial year. So our financial year runs uh, from April to March. So it lines up with the seasonality of our business. And what that means is it kind of keeps everything nicely, neatly packaged with all of our processes. So once we closed out our financial year at the end of March and we went through and did all of our reporting on that, I then also initiated the activities to start pulling together our report to claim on that year as a part of the herd management project. Also within that, you need to provide records and demonstration of new project activities that you have implemented and have continued to run, which are reasonably expected to reduce emissions. So an example of that, and this is something that we have done, is we have installed new watering points and also new fences. So we're able to decrease the grazing radius and also increase the ability to segregate our herds so then we can lift the weight for age of our animals. With each reporting period, we have to provide a written offsets report. And this is essentially just a written report that relates to that period. And it just details the critical information relating to that. So again, your herd data, the activities you undertook. And paired with that, we are required to also be audited and provide that audit report. And 
we can't use so you can't use a financial reporter for that activity you do have to engage a registered greenhouse and energy auditor um, and so these guys essentially go through and check what you've done for that reporting period and they provide assurance to the clean energy regulator that the project meets and complies with the requirements outlined in the methodology and that it also complies with the requirements of the carbon farming initiative act my understanding of the two is i guess you've got your beef cattle herd management determination so the specific guidelines of that that you need to meet but then you also have the carbon farming initiative act that links to that and there's also requirements within that that you also need to meet so how's it going and what have we learnt? um you know like i mentioned we've just come off of the submission of our second report so we're now two years in which is very exciting for our business and it's going really well in our first year, we produced 47,000 ACUs, and with our second year, we are looking at producing close to the same number of ACUs. It's just not confirmed yet until we're actually awarded that from the Clean Energy Regulator. Um, and what have we learnt from the process? For our business, we've learnt that it is, I suppose, restricted by scale for us. Um, with our herd size, and if you consider that our first reporting year we had 47,000 ACUs, it equates to only 0.2 ACU per head. And I guess understandably for each business, uh, it will vary exactly what the benefits are for you to engage in the project. Um, but just really when you're going through that process, also consider the time required, I guess, to go through the administration requirements of the project um, and also the direct cost associated with that. So um, I guess for us, we engage an external service provider that assists the process. Um, so there's a cost of that, but then there's also the cost of, say, my involvement. For my role, it's 20 to 25% of my role and my time dedicated to these projects. Um, and then something else that we've discovered through the process is we get benefits by having the project spread across a geographical dispersed areas. So for CPC, we've got cattle stations in central, western and northern Queensland, northern territory and northern WA. And having this spread, it assists us to climb to, I suppose, ride out any sort of isolated climate risks that might be happening in those areas and impact and those climate risks that might be impacting our herd. And this was really notable with the second offsets report that we've just produced, because in this period, what we've noted is some herds have produced ACUs that didn't produce ACUs in the first year. And then there's also the flip of that, where there's some herds in the first year that produced ACUs, but in the second year have not. So that's just something else to consider. Obviously, there are also just herd flow impacts for our business that will also impact the ACU, ACUs produced. Um, as I mentioned, we have engaged an external service provider to assist us. I think that they're an incredibly valuable resource for our business. They really provide the niche expertise that help us to go through the processes of registration and report, uh, producing our reports and submission. And um, I guess by bringing in someone that's really an expert in that area, they're able to understand the really minor ins and outs that are associated with participating in these style projects um, and I guess to kind of close out what and it links again back to my point that I made at the start is that what really is fantastic about this project is that it's you know you get the benefits of reducing your emissions and the accus produce out of that but you also then get the benefits out of just overall increasing the productivity of your herd so there's a lot of co-benefits that link and interrelate to each other for this project um, that is my very brief run through of our present uh, of our experience. Thank you, everyone. I hope that's enough to give you a bit of a scope of of uh, what's involved with the herd project. Thanks, Steve. Wonderful. Thanks. Thanks, Jasmine. Uh, and it's uh, again great to hear from uh, a, a real practitioner um, with a, with a project that's up and running, and some really interesting points there around zero point two actuaries per beast, if you like, and uh, and of course the the um, confirmation that the activities that are actually implemented um, also have productivity gains beyond the actuaries, which is uh, great to hear that that that's actually the case. Um, 
The next uh, methodology we look at is um, savannah burning. Uh, very briefly, and I acknowledge um, someone's comment on here already that we should have had a couple of hours and and uh, yes, that would have been great, but uh, we, it is what it is. Um, but thank you, Andrew, for coming on board. Um, Andrew has uh, worked in bushfire, you know, research and tropical savannah for for um, many years and um, has been involved in sort of uh, burnt area mapping and data collection and analysis um, for, for a long time. And in fact, uh, part of um, his work and the development of regional GIS um, across the top end um, fed into the savannah burning methodology in the early days, as I believe. Thanks, uh, Andrew. That's fine. Uh, hi, thank you, Steve, for the introduction. Um, can you all hear me and can you, is my um, PowerPoint sharing? Yes. Yes. Good. Yeah, great. Okay, so um, I'm here today, obviously, to talk about savannah burning, the methodology that's applied in the northern, probably about 20% of the continent. Uh, I work for a group called the Darwin Centre for Bushfire Research. We're based now at Charles Darwin University. And that's their lovely templated presentation, which I think you'll well, like could admire. Um, just a little bit of background information on savannah burning. So the, the methodology itself is based on many, many hundreds and hundreds of sites of uh, field data that we've collected uh, measuring biomass, pre and post fire biomass uh, at lots and lots of sites in different types of uh, vegetation classes, which we ended up classifying as vegetation fuel types based on the um, basal area, so how many stems there are, so an open forest as opposed to a woodland as opposed to an open woodland, and the uh, dominant understory grass um, habit, so whether it's a hummock or a tussock grass. Hummock grasses being mostly spinifex and the tussock grasses, you know, being you uh, heteropogons, chrysopogons, etc. So um, those data uh, we collected over many, many years, right across the Kimberley and right across the top end and up into Cape York as well. Uh, the other important thing about the methodology is that it fits within an appropriate climatic zone. This was um, work we did um, with, you know, the BOMS rainfall data, 100 years of rainfall data, looking more specifically at the data since 1970 um, to determine where, um, and, and that's intersected with our fire history information. Also, oh, for those of you who don't know, the Darwin Centre for Bushfire Research um, produce and manage the, the NAFI website, North Australia Fire Information Mapping website, where we map about 70% of uh, the Australian continent. And we've been doing that for nearly 20 years, well, not all of the 70% for 20 years, but especially the top end for uh, about 20 years. And um, we used those, that fire mapping to look at, you know, where we were getting a very seasonal nature of fire. So where it was most appropriate to apply savannah burning to reduce wildfires and improve um, greenhouse gas emissions was predominantly where we started. And so those, uh, that's why the, um, the, the region that it's appropriate to use the savannah burning methodology exists is because it's above about 600 millimetres of mean seasonal rainfall. And um, you have that uh, driest quarter having less than, oh, sorry, that's a typo. It's not 500, it's 50 millimetres of rainfall in the driest quarter. So that means you have that distinct wet season and dry season each year. And then as I described, um, the, it's only applicable in um, appropriate vegetation community. So that was done with a lot of consultation with a lot of other ecologists, a lot of other scientists, a lot of pastoralists and a lot of um, Aboriginal people to talk about those communities that needed to be excluded because they either didn't need to be burned at all or they needed to sometimes be burnt in the late dry season, uh, you know, like in the um, issue with woody thickening, which is pretty common in Cape York uh, and in parts of the Northern Territory. So here I've got listed a bunch of the resources that give all the background information in to the methodologies that have been applied. So the first one was based on that paper that I've got listed in the top left there, Improving Estimates of Savannah Burning Emissions. That's a paper we published in 2009 with all the methodolo methodological um, information in it, uh, you know, to make it easy 
relatively easy for people to read. Then that book came out, Culture, Ecology and Economy of Fire Management. So in conjunction with all of the data collection that we did, we worked with a lot of Aboriginal people in Arnhem Land who were still um, managing country in some parts, uh, um, you know, with uh, a, a fairly strong continuation of their cultural history and, and, and management style. So we this book sort of reflects on the information we gathered from them and the history of that area and a lot of methodology in there as as well. So that that book's pretty uh, pretty useful in understanding where the methodology came from and how it fits in really quite strongly with um, you know um, indigenous traditional knowledge of fire management in North Australia. And then um, the 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 2000 um, so that was what the 2013 methodology was based on. Then the 2015 methodology included the lower rainfall zone, which is um, below 1,000 millimetres down to 600 millimetres of mean seasonal rainfall. And uh, that's all of the um, methodological information is available in that second book, the Carbon Accounting and Savannah Fire Management. So that's a reference to it there. And then the 2018 methodology, which I really didn't have much to do with, um, was done by our colleagues at CSIRO who separated from the rest of us and did their own uh, methodology and produced the paper called Dead Organic Matter and the Dynamics of Carbon and Greenhouse Gas Emissions in Frequently Burnt Savannas. Um, and that's there for you to look at too. So just a bit of background again on uh, how um, heavily based the methodology is in field data. There's tons of tons of sites, as I said, right across North Australia. And we measured all these spots. We, you know, we would measure an area, not all the time, but most of the time we'd burn it. Um, and then measure it again the next day, straight after the fire to get an indication of how much of the biomass is consumed. Uh, we also used devices that um, uh, extracted the smoke from different types of fire, you know, different types of grasses and different and the wood and et cetera, et cetera. So we got an idea of what sort of gases were coming off in the smoke. Uh, and then a lot of the material was chopped up and sent to a laboratory to determine the amount of carbon. So it's very empirically based. There's a lot of data sitting behind each of the um, each of the measurements that goes into calculating how much biomass is there and how much is consumed by fire. So these are the major vegetation fuel types, the eucalypt open forest up the top, woodland, eucalypt open woodland. You can see it's the number of stems and the canopy cover lessens as you go down through that those structure, structural classes. Um, and then you've got sandstone woodland. It's that photo at the top there. You can see scattered trees, but lots of spin effects. And lots, it's mostly all that rocky country that you find um, in the North Kimberley and across sort of the centre of the top end and um, up, the, up the top of Cape York. And then you've got your sandstone heaths, which uh, more structurally described as shrublands with hummock grass understory. So again, very few trees, if any, and lots of shrubs and lots of spinifex. So they're all very different uh, and distinct fuel classes that we were able to establish from the data that we had. That's how that ended up. And here's sort of an Australia-wide, uh, sorry, North Australia-wide version of that vegetation fuel type map that we did initially. And that's what sits on Savbat for people to um, uh, to uh, estimate their emissions for various uh, parts of the country. Um, so at the moment, there's there are quite a few. I think there's more, probably more than 76, less than 80 registered projects across North Australia. So a big mob, uh, mostly on pastoral properties up in Cape York. The NT is pretty mixed. You can see all of the eastern half of the top end. That's all of Arnhem Land. That's pretty much covered in projects. Kakadu and some pastoral stations to the west of that area there. And then in the Kimberley, you've got all of those um, Balangara, Willingen, um, Danby Mangari, uh, and did I say Balangara? They're all um, projects in the high rainfall zone, in the low rainfall zone. There's the AWC properties, Marion Downs, and um, a number of the national parks, King Leopold, etc. So you can see there's quite a bit of area that's covered by Savannah Mooning and um, earning quite a bit of money per year. Um, in Western Australia, it's in the order of about $20 million um, being earned 
per year in carbon credits. It's an estimate because we don't know how much people are selling their carbon credits for after they get them, but sort of based on an estimate of about $15 or $16 per tonne. You can see there there's um, quite, a basic, quite a lot of ACCUs being earned. Uh, some people are just holding them in check and uh, a lot of the parks have only just recently registered, so they haven't uh, earned much yet. Um, but you can see it's quite an array of uh, property uh, uh, types from different sectors, so Aboriginal land, um, conservation land and um, agricultural land. Um, this is the area, so it's a total area of what's uh, the 7.6 seven, uh, 7 million hectares, quite considerable. Um, this is from a recent paper that we're um, just publishing, just outlining all the statistical, you know, statistically all the benefits of the program and um, what it means. So the reason why we've used these two periods, 2000 to 2012, then 13 to 19, because the first methodology came online in 2019. So we're just assuming that from that date onwards, things um, have changed, uh, maybe improved. But I mean, I think the data quite clearly show that they have improved in those areas with no project. You can see early dry season burning has not changed very much at all from 12 to 13 per cent. That P value is a statistical value that um, uh, um, calculates the significance. If a, So it's like you're looking for things to be more than 95 per cent significant. So if it's uh, less than point, uh, 0.05 or less, then you say it would be significant because it's like 5 per cent of the data is. Um, uh, not correlated. So, and then in the late dry season in the no project areas, you can see that um, again, there hasn't been much of a so There's a bit of a change, but not much from 21 down to 90, 19%. But then in the with project areas, you can quite clearly see very, very big changes. A lot more early dry season burning from 14 up to 25%. Late dry season burning wildfires have gone down from 26 to 7%. Um, and then um, uh, again, if we break that up by property and sector, you can see that many, all of the Indigenous properties have uh, significant um, improvements, increases in early dry season burning. A couple of them have got uh, quite significant decreases in late dry season burning. Uh, Prince Regent National Park's got a significant decrease in late dry season burning. Uh, Drysdale, so that's CI, that index, it's an index we use just to, because Part of the methodology says that early dry season burning has to, you, you know, you have to implement early dry season burning to um, to, to undertake a project and with the intent of uh, somehow suppressing or um, mitigating late dry season burning and neither of those things have occurred on Drysdale River National Park to date, unfortunately. Uh, but you can see that generally across the Kimberley, we've had some very excellent outcomes in terms of reductions in uh, so this is from an environmental perspective, uh, you know, increases in early dry season and decreases in late dry season burning. Um, the methods as they stand have, you know, uh, are a work in progress, of course, like anything. Um, and um, one of the big complaints, mostly from Queensland, not so much from the Kimberley or the NT, but mostly from Queensland is this um, problem with the cutoff date between the early and the late dry season being set at the 31st of July. There are lots of reasons why that's happened. And most of the main reason is that we just can't find any significant data to to um, support uh, the notion of changing it. <laughs> and so, you know, lots of people have done lots of studies. CSIRO have been, um, you know, contracted to, do, you know, to do something and lots of people have given it a crack, but there's nothing, there's no scientific evidence to show that that date uh, that there's anything better than using that date at this stage. Uh, the only thing we can uh, suggest is to use fire severity instead of seasonality. So instead of saying, you know, the majority of early dry season fires are of low severity and the majority, vast majority of late dry season fires are at high severity, we can say, oh, well, no matter when the fire occurs, if we can describe the um, severity of that fire, then we can, um, you know, more readily d uh, discriminate between the the different types of burning people are doing. Um, another improvement that's very pertinent to people in the Kimberley is the inclusion of the Pindan. So, and, uh, so sorry, here's a graph, and this is, I should, before I go on to Pindan, this is um, a graph illustrating where the information came from. So this is data from 
uh, a number of national parks in the top end of the NT. So it's very NT centric. Um, and you can see there that um, the majority of um, early dry season fires are low intensity, but it's pretty mixed in the late dry season. You get sort of a 30, 40, 30 mix really. Um, but if you would include moderate and high as both as being severe fires, which they sort of um, by definition are, so a moderate fire is where the canopy is affected and a high, a high severity fire is where the canopy is totally affected. So if you if you call them both high, then you would, you know, you would get about a 70% um severe fire occurring in the late dry season so that's the data that it's based on at the moment and again nobody's found anything to change that so we're going to we're going to have to look at uh wrapping this up andrew um we've still got uh, another one to go and we're uh, we're oh, almost so sorry up. okay one more slide about pindan just quick so here's the pindan this is from the land systems um we mapped it it's going to be included in the new methodology uh, pretty important that that whole area has been excluded as an uh, eligible vegetation type. It's going to be included uh, very, very soon. Gamba grass is really important. You can see there that's its current distribution. That's its potential distribution. Really need to watch out for it. Um, it's coming your way and it's really bad. And there again is a list of the resources. So sorry I was so long. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Andrew. Um, yes, we... we Many people have made the commitment to two o'clock, and um, I'm, I'm, uh, Rowan Foley is uh, about just to talk about um, things that are beyond um, the ACCUs, um, that but are certainly very much connected to the activities and processes. So while we've spoken about methodologies and and actuaries. Um, Rowan is going to tell us a little bit about the sort of co-benefits that are actually associated with um, carbon projects. Thanks, Rowan. G'day, Steve. How are you going? Good, thanks, mate. Okay, I'm just going to make five points. Um, I'm going to try and keep to the uh, title here about demystifying carbon, and um, hopefully I can do that. Uh, I'm the CEO of the Aboriginal Carbon Foundation. We've been around for about 10 years. Uh, we're a not-for-profit. Uh, we mainly work uh, in Cape York, uh, top end, and do a bit of work up in the Kimberley in the past. Um, it's the core benefits verification framework that we developed to verify the environmental, social and cultural uh, co-benefits of a project. I think that's what we're probably best known for. But I'll just, I'll just start off with the simple points. And the first one um, to remember quite simply is that carbon farming is an agribusiness. Uh, I know there's a lot of facts and figures that people will throw at you, but if you just always remember it's an agribusiness, uh, you can't go too far wrong. So what's an agribusiness? Well, you know, we operate under the iron laws of supply and demand. So you can supply a product, but if no one's going to buy it, you're not going to go very far. So supply and demand. Training, every industry needs training. And if you've got a raw product or a raw commodity like an ACU, uh, you can add value to it by putting in the environmental, social and cultural values. So, you know, and that's, you know, you don't need to be Einstein to figure out that if you sell the raw product, you're going to get uh, the base price. But if you add value, you will get a premium price. So, you know, you don't, you don't have to be too smart to figure that one out. Uh, there are two markets. There's a government market that will offer you the base price for the base commodity based in Canberra, lowest cost abatement. If you go to the other market, the voluntary market, they will pay a premium. So I've just delivered literally several hundred thousand dollars worth of investment to an Aboriginal community last week. That uh, The Commonwealth Bank of Australia made that investment, one of the biggest buys in the Australian market, in the voluntary market of Australian carbon credit units, ACUs, with environmental, social and cultural values. Now, the bank are going to use it for their promotions, their PR, uh, in amongst their staff, as they've got 50,000 staff in the bank, and they use it to promote it internally as well as externally with clients. But really, that's what you're, you're aiming for is private investment. Uh, if you can't, you know, that's, 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 where the, that's where the money is and that's where companies are willing to back you. And they also, you know, if they're going to be putting down serious coin, they want to come and meet you. So, uh, you know, be prepared for that. 
Um, the reason why companies buy, carbon is only one part of the equation. It's probably about a quarter of the equ equation. Uh, they'll buy because they want to have a social, social license to operate. So that means they'll be addressing their reconciliation action plan, their corporate social responsibility goals, and their sustainable development goals. So the big, the big boys and girls with the, the big cash and the big checkbooks, when they come, they want to know that they're getting uh, you know, a, a range of metrics being met, being met. So um, you know, carbon is only one slice of the pie. So when you're when you're selling to uh, a lot of players, they want to know what else they can get. You know, and that's that's a very important part. So look, we haven't been to Canberra in eight years. We just don't need to. The voluntary market in Australia is reasonably strong. Uh, it's going to pick up. Um, you were probably trading for between twenty-one to twenty-five dollars a ton. Um, you know, the trades have been a little bit low. But look, the main thing when I talk to people about projects, I always say to them, don't go chasing the money. Make sure your environmental, social and cultural values are verified. And there's the, that's where the training comes in. Focus on your project. And then if that's all good, then your product will be worth more in the marketplace. So, you know, you just got to remind people a bit of common sense around these things. And then when that all stacks up, uh, you know, people make good money in this in this business. Um, but you just got to stick to the basics. OK, Steve, back to you. Thanks, Ron, and appreciate it was short and a little bit truncated, but it's great to um, to see that, you know, the ACCUs uh, are not the only game in town and, uh, you know, these things work together and the co-benefits um, is a great deal of value uh, just in that alone. Um, for uh, for for most of the projects that um, you know uh, that are in play. Um, look, we will uh, collate some of the questions that are in the um, comment side of things and send those around. The um, recording will be available, um, and I will also have those. Uh, links sent around as well so that uh, you are able to download those um, and my timer is going crazy here saying we're way over time so um, thank you very much everyone for uh, attending and um, look forward to uh, getting that information out to you as soon as we can thank you thanks Steve. that's good